don't know if they're going back. That's on many people's mind. Okay, welcome everybody to our uh, weekly, uh, you know, broad broadcast seminar. Uh, and uh, we're very happy to have uh, Tom Harman today tell us about applications of the modular bootstrap. All right, thanks a lot. Um, so I'm gonna talk about two recent papers uh, with Nima F. Kamijeti, uh, Henry Cohn, one of them with David Delat and um, both with Amir Tajini. So you may know Nima and Amir. Henry and David are mathematicians who study uh, sphere packing and related problems. And we've had a really great uh, collaboration with them. It's been a lot of fun. Um, so um, first of all, please jump in with questions uh, as I go. Um, so just go ahead and interrupt. So I'm going to quickly set the stage just with some notation. So we're talking about two-dimensional conformal field theories. The partition function of a two-dimensional conformal field theory uh, is uh, can be expanded in in characters, these are the conformal blocks of the torus partition function, which I'll call chi. Um, so this is a function of the torus modulus tau, uh, and there's an independent um, tau and tau bar. Which characters we use is gonna depend on what we assume about the chiral algebra of our theory. And um, in this talk, I'm mostly gonna be talking about theories with a U1 to the C chiral algebra. So C here is the central charge, and U1 to the C means that there's as much U1 symmetry as possible. Okay, so um, there's basically, basically you could take all the full central charge and uh, get it from the U1 currents. So um, these are essentially free CFTs that we're talking about. Uh, the character of the U1 to the C algebra is um, written here. Uh, it's just Q to the H, where H is the conformal weight over a bunch of eta functions. The eta functions account for the descendants of the conserved currents from the, from the C conserved currents. The torus partition function is invariant under SL2Z uh, that acts on the modulus of the torus. This uh, falls from the fact that this is a Euclidean path integral uh, on the torus. The modular bootstrap is the program of using consistency conditions on the partition function Z, uh, especially modular invariants, uh, in order to constrain the space of conform field theories in two dimensions. An example, uh, or sort of the sort of the canonical prototypical example of modular bootstrap is a question uh, that was, um, I think, first really proposed or stressed or uh, worked on by Hellerman, which is the question, given the central charge C, what is the largest possible gap? Uh, what is the largest possible spectral gap? That is, what is the largest possible gap you can have to the first primary state uh, of dimension delta one? There's lots of other questions that you can ask with modular bootstrap, uh, but I'm gonna at least start out with this question of constraining the spectral gap, and uh, that's gonna lead us in various directions. So what are the motivations for modular bootstrap? Well, a big motivation for me is uh, to apply the bootstrap to three-dimensional quantum gravity. So there are questions about 3D gravity and gravity in general that are questions about um, not necessarily any particular theory, but about the space of theories. So in this context, we could try to use the bootstrap to ask the question, what is the landscape of three-dimensional quantum gravities? What is required in the low energy theory? What's required in the ultraviolet? Does it require strings, et cetera? A part of this question is the question is, does pure gravity exist in three dimensions? And that's something that I'm going to come back to later in the talk. Uh, but the regime for thinking about 3D gravity from the bootstrap is the regime of large central charge, because the central charge is related to the radius of ADS3, and uh, also to the regime of large conformal dimensions because it's the states of large conformal dimension that are things like black holes that are related to non-perturbative quantum gravity in the bulk. The second motivation 
that um, the second motivation for, for doing modular bootstrap in particular, as opposed to other areas of conformal bootstrap, uh, is the connections to mathematics. So um, we'll see examples of this, but to make a long story short, mathematicians love SL2Z. Uh, they've been studying constraints of SL2Z for 100 years, and we have a lot to learn from them. So, um, and I think this can, this can, is really going in both directions. Um, and it's giving us new ways of thinking about conformal field theory. It's giving us new tools for conformal bootstrap that might apply uh, even more generally and um, is giving some new insight about some old math problems. Now, uh, in studying constraints from the torus partition function, we have sort of two choices. And these two choices will also basically be the two parts of my talk. Uh, the first option, which was taken uh, in some of the earlier papers, this is the constraint studied by Hellerman, is to discard the spin information. In other words, uh, set tau to be purely imaginary. If you work on a square torus, then uh, any information about the spin, you only are keeping track of the scaling dimensions of operators, not of their spins. This has a connection uh, that Leonardo and Dalmiel and I explored last year. This has a connection to sphere packing uh, and classical codes. And in this talk, I wanna tell you sort of an update on that story and some new results in that direction. In the second part of the talk, uh, I'm gonna look at the other option, which is to include spin. That is, you can do the full, the full spinning modular bootstrap for theories with the U1 to the C chiral algebra with independent tau and tau bar and study the constraints on the partition function in that case. That is extremely highly constrained. Uh, we think, well, people think that uh, you can just write down all the partition functions with, of consistency of Ts with those symmetries. So we can study them in great detail. And this is gonna lead us toward a story of a holographic duality uh, for average CFTs uh, in part two. Okay, so let me start by um, reminding you of the connection to sphere packing. The sphere packing problem is an old problem in geometry. The question is, what is the maximal density of spheres in n Euclidean dimensions? I've drawn here the optimal sphere packing in two dimensions. Uh, in general, this turns out to be a, a extremely difficult and extremely interesting problem. Uh, well, partly because it's so difficult and it's be because it's related to so many different areas of math. Uh, the, the problem has been solved only for a short list of low-lying dimensions. Most recently and most relevant um, to our story is the solution uh, due to Vyazovska of the sphere packing problem in eight dimensions. So Vyazovska used a technique, a theorem that was uh, introduced by Cohn and Elkies um, that is a theorem that uses linear programming to place constraints on sphere packing. That theorem is essentially the modular bootstrap in disguise or vice versa. So with Dalmi and Leonardo last year, uh, we drew this connection between sphere packing and the bootstrap. The precise statement is that the Kohn-Elkies approach to bounding, the Kohn-Elkies linear programming bound on sphere packing is exactly the modular bootstrap, but not for the Virasoro algebra. It's exactly the modular bootstrap for this uh, U1 to the C uh, current algebra. In this case, it's the spinless modular bootstrap. Uh, so um, it's really the, spin, the total current algebra being, being U1 to the 2C. Under this relationship, there's a, a mapping between the sphere packing density in 2C dimensions or C is, so the number of dimensions of the sphere packing is twice the central charge of the CFT. And the sphere packing uh, density is related to the dimension of the first primary in the CFT bounds. So uh, if you derive bounds on delta one using the modular bootstrap, then uh, you also uh, get bounds on the sphere packing density uh, in 2C dimensions. 
and part of this story uh, was a, a direct relationship between Vyazovska's solution of the problem for E8 and uh, some analytic functionals that Dalamil had constructed uh, for the conformal bootstrap. But I'm not going to go into that now. The update that I want to tell you about, which is from this paper last week, is uh, on using this relationship to learn something new about sphere packing in a large number of dimensions. So um, the, large, the, the, the sphere packing problem in a very large number of dimensions, since that's related to the central charge in the dual CFT. So this is like a central charge to infinity limit of the sphere packing of the modular bootstrap problem. And uh, this is sort of a, a, a fun problem from the holography perspective because it's the C to infinity limit that's related to 3D gravity for Virasoro. And this is not Virasoro, so it's not going to be related to ordinary 3D gravity, uh, but um, maybe we'll learn something interesting from it. So this is sort of a toy version of quantum gravity. Uh, from the math point of view, this is also something that mathematicians have thought about. Um, in particular, because there's a relationship between sphere packings and classical error correcting codes. And uh, the, can, the question of how good a sphere, how, how dense can your sphere packing be in a large number of dimensions is related to the question of how good a code you can make uh, when the code has a large number of code words. So we study this problem mostly numerically uh, using a technique that um, we introduced for the Virasoro problem last year, um, which is an alternative to, to semi-definite programming. It's, it's much faster than semi-definite programming. However, uh, at least for now and maybe forever, much more limited than semi-definite programming in that it only applies uh, in a useful way to spinless problems. Okay? But this is a spinless problem. Uh, it's a bootstrap problem in one variable. Uh, so we can apply this numerical technique and see what it tells us about sphere packing in high dimensions. So I basically just want to tell you the, the, the summary plot, and I'm going to kind of dwell on this. There's a lot happening on this slide, so I want to just sit on this slide for, for a few minutes and, and kind of go through it. Um, the top half of the slide uh, so the so the the horizontal direction here um, is the is the spectral gap delta one. So over on the left is the vacuum delta equals zero. Um, and what's being plotted on the top is the uh, on the top is the results for the Virasor algebra. I'm not really going to talk about those too much. Those are just sort of here for comparison. If you're more com if you're familiar with that case, then you can compare. But we don't have anything new to say about that one. Uh, on the bottom is the summary of results for the U1 to the C algebra. OK, so what's going on uh, on this plot? Um, let's see. Let me start with, let me start uh, at the right. OK, so um, this blue line uh, is a bound on the spectral gap that was derived uh, by Kabatiansky and Levenstein analytically in 1978. So this is a long-standing, uh, this is the long-standing best-known constraint on sphere packing in a large number of dimensions. This bound is really interesting from a bootstrap point of view because it uses this technology of, of error correcting codes that really ha hasn't really entered into the bootstrap world. Um, and I think um, maybe we have something to learn from it for analytic purposes. Uh, but anyway, this has, been the, this has been the best known analytic bound um, for a long time. Um, okay, the next thing, uh, to, so, so the statement to reiterate is that uh, Kabatiansky and, and Levenstein proved that every theory with a U1 to the C current algebra has a state below uh, this number. Seven. So this is the numerical bound. Um, so 
Um, so this is the new this is the new result of using this numerical technique at um, large central charge for the u1 to the c algebra. So this is the new result. Um, and I, there are a couple things that I would want to mention about it. So first of all, um, it's slightly better than the Kabanji on C Levenstein bound. Now we don't know for that we don't know that for certain. This relies on numerical extrapolation, uh, but we think that at least the first three digits here are reliable, uh, and probably the fourth. So we think that the that the actual bootstrap bound is better than slightly better than Kabanji and Levenstein, although they're extremely close. Dom, the, so you think the numerics have converged, so this is the actual uh, optimal bound that uh, up to these three digits. Um, we we believe this is the optimal bound. We've only we can only go up to C of a, of a few thousand, and we can get a convergent bound up to C of a few thousand, which has not reached this value yet. Uh, we have to extrapolate to get this value. The other thing I want to point out is that this is C over pi squared. Okay, I don't know if we should take that seriously, um, but at least three digits are working. If you take our, and, and we didn't, we weren't trying to fit to pi squared, but if you take our, if you take our central value for our extrapolation, you get five digits of pi squared. So I don't know. I, all, I, all I would say is that if there's a nice number that can be explained analytically, it's gonna be pi squared. I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's true. Okay, um, so that's the main numerical result. Now, the other um, thing that I wanna draw your attention to on this plot is this bound here. Forget U1, gra forget, forget U1 gravity for a minute, um, but this, the Cardi bound. Okay, so uh, let's compare to Virasoro for a minute. So in, in Virasoro, the Cardi bound is C over 12. That's where the first black holes show up in three-dimensional gravity. From a CFT point of view, what Cardi gap means is it, it means that if you take the if if you try to take a theory that just has the identity, just the vacuum representation, then that would not be modular invariant. So you might try to include its uh, its image under the S transform, and then you could ask what states appear in the in the in the image in, in the dual channel. So if you do that for Virasoro, then uh, you find this C over 12 bound, which is exactly where the black holes show up. And there's an interpretation of the black holes as sort of the dual of the, uh, of the vacuum rep in, a, in another channel. If you do the same thing for the U1 to the C, you find this bound C over two pi E. So I'm highlighting that because it's gonna come back in a minute when we talk about U1 gravity. So Tom, can I, can I ask you a question to clarify the relation with Konelki's theorem? Yeah. So if I understand correctly, you, you said that Konelki's theorem is the same as the spinless modular bootstrap for you onto the C. However, there's a separate question. If you have a modular invariant partition function for you onto the C, does this actually give you sphere packing? Um, yeah, the, the answer to that is no. The answer to that is no. So you, the, there's a, so, well, is so, very so strongly no? believed to be no. So in general, the cone elkies bound is not saturated by actual sphere packings. And I think this is similar to the bootstrap in the sense that this is just one constraint among many. And there are lots of other constraints that sphere packings have to satisfy. The relationship between the bootstrap and sphere packing as far as we know, is, is limited entirely to the cone elkies bound and the spinless modular bootstrap. As far as we know, there is not a, any more general relationship between sphere packings and CFTs. Okay, then can I ask, this kabatansky levenstein bound, if it's not in terms of this linear programming bound, then does it apply to partition functions of uh, this you want to the C CFTs? Okay, good. Yeah, so the Kabantiansky Levenstein bound was originally derived from error correcting codes, but it's been shown that you can get the same bound from linear programming. So that means that yes, it does apply to CFTs. Oh, okay, thank you. Does it have a simple analytic form? The KL bound? Yeah. 
Um, it's simple enough. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's something that you have to um, find the root of a, of a trigonometric equation and then plug it in. So it's, it's something you can do in one line in Mathematica. Okay, so um, this, is, this is basically it for the spinning results. So let me pause here. Are there other questions before I go on to part two? Uh, Tom, I would like to clarify this uh, bound C over 2 pi E. Does it also apply to the sphere packing in a sense that you now improve the uh, kabatinsky Livingstein bound? No, so that is not a bound. This is the, the, the Cardi bound is, sorry, the Cardi gap is not a bound. Um, in, the same, in the same way that, that in 3D gravity, we don't know that every theory has, has states at the black hole threshold or sorry, in the, in the CFT version of 3D gravity. So it's not, a, it's not a bound on anything. It's just an estimate of what you might expect in a theory that, that um, has an identity and not much else. It's sort of a guess for what might happen. In the Virasor case, it's a guess for what would happen in a gravity-like theory. In the U1 to the C case, uh, we could kind of extrapolate and say it's some kind of analog of the black hole threshold in a U1 to the C type theory. If I'm only interested in the uh, sphere packing question, uh, is it reasonable to expect now that there is a better way to uh, pack spheres using lattice to achieve this uh, density uh, C over 2 pi E? Good. Um... Yes, I mean, I think I think the I think sphere packings can be um, I want to say that you can achieve this, but I uh, I'm not sure actually. I have to think about that. I'm not sure. Uh, Tom, just to clarify what you mean by Cardi gap, like if you take the vacuum character for U1 to the C and branch it into the cross channel, that decomposition still starts at the unitarity bound, right? Yeah, that's right. I, it's I, a statement I'll, about the integrated density or something? This is so. So the the spectrum in the in the dual channel is continuous, but yeah, yeah. this is where you find there's actually one full state. It's 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 continuous, but it has this very tiny tail below this. Yeah, line. yeah. It's in one state. So, so it's a statement about the integrated density. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Other questions? Let's, let's go to part two. So now um, what we're going to do is include thin. So we're going to consider the full partition function uh, for these free CFTs with the U1 to the C by U1 to the C algebra. This does not correspond to bounds on, on, on general sphere packings. That's easy to check because you can just derive a bound and check whether using the same dictionary that we used in this in the spinless case you could just check whether it's plausible that this could be bound and it's not plausible sorry Tom, so, i have a more basic question when you say that these are free cfts is that totally obvious can you prove that the entire space of cfts with uh, you want to the c chiral algebra is just a, it's a lattice of free bosons even for c equal one that's not totally obvious to me yeah so i I, I don't think you can prove this, or at least I don't think anybody has proved this. Um, so I'm using the word free sort of loosely. I mean, you can bosonize the C currents and then you get C, okay, and then and you have nothing left because the central charge is C. Yes. So 
I think whatever the theories are, they should be sort of considered free in some sense, but it's not clear to me that they're just exclusively the, the Narayan CFTs. Right. Well, you just, yes. you can take the CFT quotient it by U1 to the power C, and then you get a topological field theory because the total central charge vanishes. So it's a product of a topological theory and a free theory. I think that may be a little fast, right? I mean, even for C equal to one, is there a complete classification theorem? I know people make claims, but. Well, the quotient is the C equals zero thing. So it must be a topological field theory in two dimensions. So up to a topological field theory, you are done. That sounds very reasonable to me. Yeah. But I mean, even for C equal to one, aren't there exo these exotic theories that Ginsberg found? I mean, are they free? In which sense are they free? I mean, those and are all orbifolds. General, you had in mind is quotients by the tetrahedral and octahedral and yes, the that's right. groups, right? I mean, they're orbifolds of the self two boson. Yeah, so once you quotient them by the U1, you'll get the TQFT corresponding to some forbidden algebra. And that, yeah. I see. Okay. Um, okay, and so this is based on this other paper with, with Nima, Henry, and Amir. Uh, there was another paper uh, that, um, so independent uh, paper by Maloney and Witten in parallel that um, explored some very similar ideas and um, made a similar proposal to what I'm going to make here. So, um, uh, Tom, can I ask a question? Yeah. So when you say that uh, it's not reasonable to expect that this gives a, a bound because because there are some there are some upper bounds, uh, there are some explicit examples of the sphere pickings at very large C that you use to make this conclusion? Uh, what no, does it mean not reasonable? This conclusion is made at finite C where we have explicit explicit known sphere packings that violate the bound you would get. If you assume that there was a bound, if you assume that before I gave this relationship between delta one and the sphere packing density, if you, if you try to take that same dictionary and still see if it could still be true, there, there are counter examples like at C equals, I think already at C equals well, below C equals six, at C equals 16 and below, there are already counter examples from known packings. Okay, so we're still gonna look at this question of delta one for now. For small values of the central charge, we can do this numerically. Um, so we did derive numerical bounds on delta one and compare that to, uh, to known CFTs. Um, we also found the analytic functional corresponding to the, to the case C equals one. This is the case where the um, optimal theory is the self-dual boson, um, so it's sort of, which is sort of obvious, I think, but um, the functional is a functional that only exists, so it's a functional that does not factorize into H and H bar. It does not factorize in the left and right movers. It's a functional that really uses the full structure of the spinning bootstrap. Um, so that's what we thought was interesting. Um, but in this talk, I'm going to focus on large C. So what can we say about delta one as C goes to infinity? Well, one thing we can do is we can look for examples and see how big we can make the gap. So we can construct free CFTs by compactifying C bosons on a torus. And uh, then we know the partition function. So the partition function is given here. It's a sum over weights uh, in a Narain lattice. The, a Narain lattice um, is an even self-dual lattice in, uh, uh, of signature C comma C. We're taking C left equals to C right here. Uh, so it's an even self-dual lattice of signature C comma C. Um, it has to be even so that the spins are integer. It has to be self-dual so that the partition function is modular invariant. So just to orient ourselves, for example, the compact boson, uh, the Narain lattice is just the lattice of momentum and winding. Now, we don't know how to find the Narain lattice with maximal gap. We explored this in some low dimensions and found some numerically, but in general, we don't know how to find the Narain lattice 
for the maximal gap. However, uh, we can do a trick. We can use a trick um, which mathematicians use to constrain the existence of lattices, and that's to average. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to compute delta 1 for an average Narain lattice. This turns out to be easier than individual Narain lattices. And if you can find the average, well, then at least you have a lower bound on, at least you know that the delta 1 can be as big as the average. So what do we mean by average? Well, the range CFTs have moduli space, uh, which is very well understood. There's actually only one Narain lattice up to the action. In any given C, in any number of dimensions, there's only one Narain lattice up to the action of OCC. And that allows you to write down this, this moduli space explicitly. Um, in, the, in the denominator, uh, these factors of OC times OC, these are because the, the action on just the individual halves of the, like the first C pieces of the Narain lattice and the second C, if you act individually on those, that doesn't change the CFT. And uh, this discrete factor is uh, T-duality. So this is the analog of R goes to one over R in the compact boson. So again, to orient ourselves uh, for the compact boson, this moduli space is just R bigger than one uh, because of the T-duality. So for C greater than two, this space has a finite volume under the Haar measure for OCC. And that means that the that averaging is well defined. It makes sense. There's a, there's a natural measure on the moduli space of these theories, and it makes sense to average over it. This is actually true also at C equals two, that, that this space has finite volume, but there's some weird things about the case C equals two, so I'm going to restrict to C greater than two. So what does it mean to average, uh, average the CFT? Um, it just means to integrate over moduli with respect to the Haar measure. Um, and we can use that to define an average partition function. So um, these double brackets mean ensemble average. And um, on the right-hand side, I've written, the, I've written how we're doing this average. So we, it's, it's really an average, not a sum. So we divide by the volume of moduli space and then integrate against the Haar measure. The Zamoljakov metric for, for Narain CFTs is OCC invariant and therefore agrees with the Haar measure uh, up to scaling. And since we're averaging, the scaling just drops out. Um, so another way you could say it is that we're average, averaging with respect to the Zamoljakov measure on the moduli space of these CFTs. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. So is there some physical reason why you want to average over the Haar measure as opposed to some other measure on the moduli space? Like in some sense, you want to preserve the duality OC comma C. Um, other than this being the natural metric, I don't, I, I don't have a, a good reason other than this being the natural metric on moduli space. Um, this is just what we're gonna pick. Okay. But this is probably gonna be correlated with the gravitational interpretation? Well, I don't know how to do, I, I want, there's gonna be a gravitational interpretation in this case. I don't know if there is one for any other choice of measure. Right, so, 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 so what I was trying to say is that maybe this measure is special in order to have a gravitational interpretation. But do you see do you, do you, do you, do you see physically why that's the case? Um, well, at the technical level, I I can see why. I mean, it's going to be important when we go to the gravitational interpretation. It's going to be important that we have this OCC invariance because be, the, the answer we get on the gravity side is going to be OCC invariance. So, but is that imposed by some gauging or no? It actually comes from the sum over topologies. So I, um, yeah, maybe, maybe we can come back to this later when you talk about the gravity. OK. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, can I ask uh, uh, another question? Yeah. So 
somewhere on the moduli space uh, of the Naran lattice CFT, uh, this is just a number of free fermions. Uh, to be more precise, um, the bosonization of a number of free fermions will be um, one of this Naran lattice CFT. And yeah. we are averaging over uh, all the exactly marginal deformation. And from the free fermion point of view, uh, some of the four fermion interactions are exactly marginal. So in that you're, sense, you're, saying, you're saying we could we could slide off this moduli space into a different direction. Or in that sense, is it similar to like a 2D IK where we start with fermions and average over the four fermion interaction? Oh, I see. You're saying, let's see. Um, For example, let's do C equals to one. Then there's only one exactly marginal deformation. And then the average over that one dimensional line is literally the average over the four fermion theorem coupling of that direct fermion. I see. Uh, that's a really interesting point. Mm -hmm. um, I, ha I haven't thought about it that way. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so this averaging over Narain lattices uh, was done by, amazingly, was done by Ziegel in 1951. So um, he first considered um, Euclidean lattices, but also has a, a, a lot of really interesting work on, on Narain lattices. So the Narain lattice was really rediscovered by Narain, but had been studied extensively by Siegel. In CFT language, I'm just going to quote Siegel's result, and then um, I'm going to sketch how it's derived. Uh, so of course, he didn't say it this way. Um, the formulas are take a little bit of effort to unpack, but it's basically in his papers that you can find, you can almost find the following formula. So this is Siegel's formula uh, for the measure on a random Narain lattice. In other words, for the average density of states. So let's stare at this formula for a bit. Um, so rho L of delta is the, the so L is the spin. So um, L is discrete. And then for any given spin, we're looking at the, um, spectrum as a function of dimension delta. Um, so what do we notice here? First of all, um, it's continuous. That makes sense. We're averaging uh, and it's continuous. Secondly, it extends all the way down uh, to the unitary bound, which I have a typo in. So the unitary bound is um, delta greater than or equal to mod L. Um, so it extends all the way down to the unitary bound. Um, what else do we notice about this? Well, it's a complicated function. Okay, so this, this sigma here is a divisor function. Um, so there's some like number theory sort of coming into this, uh, into this formula. It's fairly elaborate. So I'm gonna sketch how this is derived. This is not how Siegel derived it. I think it's probably. I think this derivation is is probably fair, is probably basically standard to mathematicians. At least the ideas certainly are. But I'm going to sort of say it in a bootstrappy in in a bootstrap kind of way. And I just want to give the basic idea uh, because this is very much a bootstrap argument. As a warm up problem, we're going to start with Euclidean lattices. So not not this funny signature, but Euclidean lattices of determinant one. The moduli space of Euclidean lattices is just SLDR uh, up to um, integer transformations of the basis vectors, which is SLD comma Z. So Siegel uh, studied this problem first, and he showed that the average density of lattice vectors in uh, a Euclidean lattice is this formula here. I meant, I meant to hide it and see if anybody had a guess, but I guess I already showed you the answer. Okay, so what is this saying? It's just saying that if you, if you look at some volume element in Euclidean space, and then you, you average over all lattices and ask how often does a lattice point exist in that volume, the answer is just proportional to the volume. With the exception of this delta function, you always have a, 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 a lattice vector of length zero, which is just the point at the origin. Okay, so 
on average, the number of lattice vectors in a volume is rho dv. The proof of this is really nice. So here's the proof. Um, the measure has to be invariant under SLDR, but Euclidean space has only two orbits under SLDR. It has uh, the origin. So under, under the symmetry, the origin doesn't go anywhere, it just stays put. And everything else, it acts transitively on everything else. So any, you can move any point to any other point. Uh, what that means is that, well, on each of these orbits, uh, the measure has to be SLDR invariant. The only reasonable measure, and, and that means that the full measure is just gonna be the sum over orbits uh, of the invariant measure on each orbit. The only tricky part is the coefficients. Okay, so uh, the invariant, well, the only measure on a point is the delta function. So that's the, that's the orbit corresponding to the, to the origin. It's easy to fix the coefficient there because every lattice has exactly one point at the origin, uh, so the coefficient is one. Uh, the only invariant, the only SLDR invariant measure on the rest of space uh, is the constant one. Um, so in other words, just the usual volume. Um, so we know the answer up to this constant. To fix the constant, we can use the asymptotics. So in this case, uh, we said that we're averaging over lattices with the determinant one. And the statement that a lattice has determinant one is just the statement that on average, well, one way of one, well, that means that the volume of a unit cell is one. So if you look at very large scales, that means that um, it always has one point per unit volume. Okay, so we can use the asymptotics at large, uh, at, of very large balls um, to fix the coefficient A2. So this is also one, um, and that gives us the answer uh, of zeal. So far so good? All right, let's go to Narain lattices. So uh, Narain lattices are more complicated. Um, if we think about the points in the Narain lattice as points x comma y, uh, then the relationship to the CFT data is that um, the scaling dimension is x squared plus y squared. The spin is, well, times a half. The spin is a half of x squared minus y squared. Now we're going to study how this, how the, how the OCC symmetry constrains this measure, uh, but OCC preserves the spin. It preserves the uh, value of, of x squared minus y squared. Of course, by definition, OCC preserves that. Um, so it preserves the spin. And that means that in considering the measure on average Narain lattices, we now have an infinite set of orbits labeled by the spin to be compared to the two orbits that we had in the Euclidean case. Just as in the Euclidean case, uh, it's easy to fix the coefficient, it's easy to fix the measure on each orbit. It's just given by the homogeneous measure on hyperbolic space. So in this case, uh, there, if you think of this, if you think of this equation as defining a, hyper, a hyperboloid in RC comma C, there's a metric on that hyperboloid and you can calculate its volume element very easily and that gives this formula um, for the invariant measure. So um, where we are now is that um, we've fixed the measure on each orbit, uh, but now we have to put them all together and just like in the Euclidean case, we need to find the coefficients. So we need to fix an infinite number of coefficients and just like in the Euclidean case, we're gonna do that by studying the asymptotics. In other words, um, we, know that we know that we have this formula, and we're gonna take delta to infinity at fixed spin, uh, use and find the asymptotics in that limit, and then use that to fix the coefficients. I'll sketch this quickly. Here's the idea. 
uh, uses the Hardy Littlewood circle method, uh, which is like a fancy version of the Cardi formula. The um, starting point is just to write the partition function, uh, just to write down a general partition function as a sum over spins and an integral against the spectral density rho. Now we can formally, or really actually, in principle, we can invert that um, by first doing a Fourier transform um, to pick off a particular spin, and then doing an inverse Laplace transform uh, to pick off the, to, to read off the, the dependence on delta. So in principle, we just have to do this integral. Um, in practice, that's not actually how you do it. In practice, uh, the way you do it is using modular invariance. So uh, if we're interested in the asymptotics of the spectrum, then that's controlled by the beta goes to zero limit uh, of this partition function. And um, in this limit, the integral is dominated near the cusps of SL2z. That is uh, basically near the near the singularity in the partition function and all of its images under the modular group. The images, um, so the points where this thing, uh, the, the points that you have to worry about in this integral are the rational points along the, uh, along the real axis in the upper, in the hyperbolic plane. So here A and B are integers, um, these are the cusps. So the integral is dominated near the cusps, and um, you can also do a modular transformation to uh, understand the behavior of this partition function near the cusps without even knowing anything about, without knowing anything about the theory, just using the um, fact that it's u1 to the c in very much the same way as we do the Cardi formula. So um, then we use modular invariance to calculate z near the cusps, then we can evaluate this integral um, and sum over rationals. So that's the circle method. You evaluate this integral, you sum over rationals, and I won't go through the details, but that gives this uh, measure of Siegel on uh, this spectrum of Siegel on, on the random Narain CFT. I'm now going to talk about the holographic duality. Are there questions on that on this before I go on? Uh, yeah, can I ask a quick question? So, uh, should I continue this formula to c equals or less than two? So you said that this is only convergent. The the average is only convergent if c is greater than two. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. The um, I I think the formula doesn't really make sense for for c less than two because um, well, if we stare at the formula, it, blow, it, it blows up at the unitarity bound. Right. Um, I'm going to stick to C greater than 2. It, I think C equals 2, you probably can make sense of, um, but it's a little different. There, there's some extra, like, logs or something in the, in the density of states. Maybe that, sen maybe that case can be made sense of. Okay, thank you. Okay, other questions before I go on to the bulk? So why is it so hard to find the uh, gap in any given, in, uh, for, you know, for uh, any given array compatification? Is it... Well, for any given one, it's easy. No, I'm sorry, for, uh, you know, the, find the maxi maximize the gap over the space of array of compatification. Um, I don't know, I mean, this is the problem of finding dense lattices. And it's, as far as we know, that's just not a problem. That's just not an easy problem. There are various results, like of um, the various results in low dimensions, a few examples in high dimensions, but in general, that seems to be a hard problem. Thanks. Can I ask a follow up question to that? So, uh, in in graph theory, sometimes we say, okay, like, okay, you can, you want to find an, a, a graph, you find an average graph, and often happens that an average graph has exactly the property that you're looking for. Like, would you say that an average narrowing lattice is like 
dense on average or is it not dense on average? Um, that's what I'm coming to right now. Okay, great. Okay, so um, if you look at where this spectral density becomes of order one, uh, the answer is, is at c over two pi e. Okay, so at large c, uh, the answer is that at, at large c, um, average Noreen lattices have a surprisingly large gap. It grows with c. Remember that this is the Cardi, this is the Cardi estimate. Um, and if you were going to try to do something like holography for these theories, um, then this is really intriguing. And if you've spent time playing with 3D gravity and you find a theory that saturates the Cardi bound, then like alarm bells are going off at this point that there's some kind of holography at work here uh, because that's basically what we expect to happen in, in a theory of pure gravity. Now, this is not going to be ordinary pure gravity, um, but we're going to look for um, some analog of holographic duality for these averaged Narain theories. Okay, so what does this have to do with 3D gravity? To explain that, let me back up a little bit and review the situation of ordinary gravity in three dimensions and what we know or don't know about a, its holographic dual. Maloney and Witten in 2007 proposed a formula for the partition function of pure gravity. Let me unpack this a little bit. So the, for, the thing showing up here is the Virasor vacuum character. That's also the one loop partition function of gravitons in ADS-3. So this is the perturbative contribution around a given saddle point of 3D gravity. The sum over topologies, um, so, so the, the proposal of Maloney and Witten to calculate the path integral was we take the one loop answer and then we sum over topologies. What that means is we're summing over um, ways of filling in the torus. We have a torus at the boundary, uh, but there's an, there's an infinity worth of ways of filling in that torus. You choose a contractible cycle and you fill it in. So that's what we mean by summing over topologies. And the idea was that these are the saddle points of three-dimensional gravity, so we should just sum over saddle points in order to, define, to try to define a non-perturbative path integral. These sums over uh, images of SL2Z are called Poincaré series. Um, and have been studied a lot by mathematicians. So they did the sum, and the um, answer didn't make sense. There were two reasons that it didn't make sense. First of all, the spectrum was continuous. Now that, maybe we could be okay with that. I mean, non-compact theories can have a continuous spectrum. Uh, maybe we could live with that. Something weird is that it has a vacuum state. So it has a vacuum state and a continuous spectrum. That we might be more worried about. Maybe there's some way to live with that. Um, the other problem with it, though, is more serious, and that's that it's non-unitary. So there, there's negative density of states in this partition function. Uh, so there have been various proposals for how to fix this over the last 13 years, uh, which I won't go into, but the status of this is unresolved. You can um, maybe fix up, it seems that you can include some more contributions and fix up the unitarity issue, uh, but it certainly is gonna stay continuous and there is no clear, inter there's no interpretation of this as a CFT. Uh, another element of this, which is more recent, uh, is what's happened in two-dimensional gravity in the last couple years. In two dimensions, pure gravity uh, is JT gravity, and it was found in, work of Saad Schenker at Stanford, that JT gravity is holographically dual to a random matrix theory. It's the sum over topologies in two-dimensional gravity that somehow include the effects of averaging in random matrix theory. So this provides a beautiful interpretation of a theory with a continuous spectrum in terms of an ensemble average of more ordinary theories. So a question uh, that I think has been on a lot of people's minds since the work of Saad Schenker and Stanford is whether 3D gravity is also an ensemble average 
3D gravity is in many ways similar to JT gravity. However, it's not clear what this would mean. The, the, CFT duals, the CFTs dual to pure gravity are, are, have no marginal operators, they're isolated. And um, it's hard to imagine how you would average over them. It, it, it doesn't seem like it would be an average, it can't be an average over moduli space. Pure gravity doesn't have a moduli, have a moduli space. Maybe in some sense it's an average over CFT data obeying the bootstrap conditions, but nobody knows how to really make sense of that. Or the, the paper today by 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 Kotler and Jensen. Maybe they have made some progress on this. But go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. So the, these things about ensemble averages, do, is it some sort of low dimension uh, phenomenon, or could you imagine like even that even a theory in four D gravity a theory with actual gravitons could be this? Because I'm worried about what, what this means for for the S matrix and so on. Um. I think that I think the answer to that is that we don't know if there can so the the basic hallmark of an average theory is that you have Euclidean wormholes, which major, maybe I'll mention in a minute. But but if you have Euclidean wormholes, it's hard to avoid having having some kind of averaging going on. Um, in theories that are dual to a particular CFT. Um, then somehow the contribution of the Euclidean wormholes has to cancel. But um, I don't think we really understand how that's supposed to work in any detail. I, I think the answer is that we just, we don't really know in higher dimensions. Okay, so the idea is, is to replace Vera Soro by U1 to the C in the maloney witten story and try again. And that leads us to the following conjecture. The conjecture is that the theory of an average Narain CFT is holographically dual to some exotic theory of in three dimensions that we call U1 gravity. U1 gravity is similar to U1 to the C times U1 to the C churn simons theory, but it's uh, similar in, it, it's similar, it's the same perturbatively on the torus, uh, but it's not literally U1 to the C by U1 to the C churn simons theory. Here's the action. Uh, this captures the perturbative excitations on the torus. We don't have a full non-perturbative definition, uh, but the sort of working definition is that um, you take these two copies of U1 to the C with opposite sign, one for left movers and one for right movers, and then um, you sum over three manifold topologies. So the sum over topologies is not something you would normally do in Chern-Simons theory. Here it's just being put in by hand as part of the prescription for how to try to define this theory. The reason for picking this theory is because it has the perturbative excitations of a U1 to the C by U1 to the C current algebra. In other words, uh, if you calculate the one loop partition function for this Chern Simons theory, then you find the U1 to the C vacuum character. Remember that if you do this for gravity, you find the Virasoro vacuum character. And the name of the game here is to try to replace Virasoro by U1 to the C. Now with this theory, we're gonna follow, follow this 2007 paper of Maloney and Witten and do the Poincaré sum over three-dimensional handle body topologies. There are other topologies in, that you might wanna consider. Uh, we're excluding them by hand, Again, it's not clear why I should do that. This is just something that works. So if you take the, um, so now we're trying to define the partition function of the bulk theory. You take this one loop answer, you sum it over topologies. Uh, this turns out to be a very simple or relatively simple mathematical object that has been studied a great deal by mathematicians called the non-homomorphic Eisenstein series. So you can do the sum. I won't go through the, uh, I won't go through that part. Uh, but you can do the sum, and then you can extract from it the, the corresponding spectrum. So you can calculate the spectrum of this putative theory uh, in three dimensions. And um, what you find is that 
the spectrum that comes out of this calculation is that exactly Ziegel's measure on random terrain lattices. This is the main point, and this motivates this conjecture. So when we first did this calculation, it seemed like a complete miracle. Uh, but of course, this relationship was very well known to mathematicians. In fact, Siegel derived this formula as well. Um, he, he knew that the, the um, non-homorphic Eisenstein series is another way of calculating the, the averaged partition function in a range CFT, and this fits into a, a, a bigger set of ideas um, called the siegel weil formula, uh, which allow you to extend this to higher genus and other kinds of lattices and all sorts of other extensions. Hey, Tom, I had a question yeah. about this remark that you just made. Yeah. I want to ask it already before, but on higher genuses, I don't expect the duality would actually be a property of the partition function. It's known that the duality uh, only preserves the partition function up to some local terms. So the statement, are you, talking, are you saying the t-duality or holographic duality? I didn't catch it. The t-duality, like the thing that you quotient it to define the Narain lattices? Yeah. The duality does not leave the partition function invariant on the genus 2 surface. You might get things like, you know, logarithm of the radius of the compact boson times the Ricci scalar. Let's see. Um, Is there not some way of defining the partition function that makes it invariant? Maybe, maybe the path integral is not invariant, but it's, there's something that's invariant, isn't there? I don't know the answer. No? Okay, I'm not sure. We only consider the torus. Uh, sorry, I, I'm confused about the question. Uh, we're talking about the same CFT, right? I mean, the things written by TDO, they're literally identical to CFT. Doha, are you worried about the conformal anomaly? Is, yes, is that the issue very similar. Yeah, it's very similar. You just like uh, spit out some local term. Like you change, uh, but, the diliton, you change the diliton by the logarithm of the compact boson. But, but I, I thought, uh, I mean, the issue you're worried about, I thought, isn't that just a conformal anomaly for any partition function of a given central charge on a higher genus surface? Uh, it's it's, uh, exactly it's only modular invariant if you are careful enough, right? I mean, yeah, it's very example, similar to conformal anomaly. It's indeed very, very similar. Yeah. I think it's sometimes it's equivalent. Uh, I mean, because we would say that the TDO numeric acid describe the same uh, CFT. But, but uh, you're just saying that, you know, there's potentially this subtlety of the conformal yeah, anomaly. because of the conformal the anomaly. Of yeah, that's right. So because of the conformal anomaly, how can you integrate it? It's not even invariant. Yeah, well, one has to choose a, uh, a conformal frame to define the yeah. identifying function more precisely, in other words. So you are saying that we have to choose some kind of fundamental domain by fiat? Uh, I mean, you can, uh, if you have a reference CFT, uh, you can always, uh, the same thing certain charge, you can always take the ratio of the partition function. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to choose the arbitrary partition domain. Okay, yeah, yeah. thanks. Well, I have a question about the previous slide. So you wrote non-compact. Can, can you say again, what do you mean by that? Is huh. the game compact? Yeah, they, they, so, um, this is not, the, the point is, this is not really Trent Simon's theory. Um, and when I say it's non-compact, um, what I mean is, so yes, on the torus, we can just take it to be, we could take, the gauge group is really R, not U1. Um, in other words, we're not summing also over non-trivial gauge configurations. We're just doing, the, we're, we're using the perturbative churn simons and then summing over topologies. There is not an additional sum over the, over the gauge configurations. If you, if you were to do that, you would get the wrong answer. Huh. This is almost the same as doing a, a gauge group R. Um, I think it is the same on the torus, but I think it's probably, I think it's not quite the same on higher genus. And I don't really know what else to say about it. But isn't there a law in quantum gravity that the gauge group is always compact? Um, yeah, but this is not really. I mean, I, I don't know how that. I don't know how to translate that here. I mean, this is not really ordinary gravity. Sure. Uh, but isn't this analogous to uh, the SL two formulation of three D gravity? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Okay, thank you.
Okay, I was about to make a similar Can comment. I ask a question uh, about, yeah. the previous, about the previous slide? Uh, so, uh, so the expansion over here, you're, this is an expansion in terms of Vera Soro characters, you're saying? No, this is an expansion in the U1 characters. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I forgot to write, yeah, that's, that's U1 characters. Okay, and, and, this, and this row L, which you showed previously, I mean, uh, was that the density of states of all, all states or was that the density of states of primaries only? Primaries only. Okay, and, okay, and that matches with this. Okay, yeah. thanks. Okay, so a couple of comments that we sort of already addressed. First of all, this is not gravity. Obviously, it's not gravity, uh, but it's not completely not gravity. I mean, it does have Virasoro, and uh, so it has a boundary graviton. That boundary graviton in ordinary gravity would just be from the metric. In this case, it's sort of a composite that you can um, understand as sort of mimicking the uh, Sugawara construction in the CFT. So maybe there's something sort of gravity-like about it. The second comment is that this is not really Chern Simon's theory for the reasons we were just talking about. Uh, for comparison, uh, ordinary 3D gravity is sort of like a Chern Simon's theory, but not quite. And the uh, rough idea we have in mind is that there's a similar relationship here, that there's a theory, U1 gravity, which is similar to, but not quite, Chern Simon's theory. As I mentioned, um, Maloney and Witten um, had, a, had the same idea to average over Narain lattices. Uh, they, also looked at, um, they also looked at higher genus and in particular at disconnected manifolds. So I wanted to mention one outcome of that from their paper. Um, the, one of the most striking things about an average theory is that you can have correlations, you can have correlation functions of the partition function. So obviously this would just factorize in an ordinary theory, uh, but when you do an ensemble average, the partition function will not factorize anymore. And in the language of 3D gravity, this corresponds to a, a, um, a case where you have two torus boundaries, one for each, one boundary condition associated to each of these partition functions, uh, but you can have connected geometries that contribute to the path integral. And, um, Maloney and Witten showed that showed using the siegel vey formalism um, formula that uh, that this calculation works as well. So there there are connected contributions to this uh, Chern Simons like theory uh, that agree with the um, averaged product of partition functions uh, for Narain CFTs. So this is a connection. Now in three dimensions between Euclidean wormholes and ensemble averaging. There's been some really interesting work on this in the last couple of weeks uh, by the people mentioned um, at the bottom here uh, in the context of actual pure gravity. Um, so I think there's still, but I think there's still a lot to be understood about the gravity case. So I'm gonna stop here. Uh, we talked about the case of this algebra ignoring spin and connected to new results in sphere packing and then um, the more um, more complete analysis of actual cfts with this symmetry led us to hints of averaging in ads cft from the sum over topologies all right thanks thank you very much tom this beautiful talk uh questions i have a question so given that you, you showed this result that basically an average uh, Nairain lattice to this formula has a very large gap, does it this mean that you shouldn't just do any search, just pick whatever, run your random number generator, pick whichever Nairain lattice according to this, and uh, compute the spectrum, and it should get something very huge? Um. Yeah, that's right. Um, let's see. I, I asked our mathematician friends about this, and the um, the answer was that this is hard to do for some reason. I'm trying to remember why. Um, I think you're right that you could just do that numerically, but even like for even for ordinary lattices, there isn't there isn't a systematic way 
to analytically write down a procedure that would that would be useful in a large number of dimensions. You you can there's a there's an algorithm that'll do it, um, but it becomes really hard to actually to actually implement. So like so or you could Quato, uh, so Quato had some results that were also using some sort of randomized approach. I forget exactly what. Yeah, that's right. There's there's a conjecture of Torquato and Stillinger that that you can achieve a certain density with very disordered packings. Um, but is it, yeah, there's a conjecture that you can do that. But there's no actual construction. There's a, so there's a lower bound um, on on how good you can do it. How, how, how well you can pack in a high number of dimensions. It just comes from the idea that you look around in your lattice and you see if there's enough room to put another copy of your lattice, like squeezed in between. Um, like if you have a, think of it as a sphere packing, can you, can you, can you squeeze another, another copy of your sphere packing next to the existing sphere packing? So that gives a lower bound on, on, on the density. That lower bound cannot be achieved. But I'm not, talking about sphere packing. I'm talking about this uh, second part of your talk. Um, right, but I'm just saying that the um, I think that's a similar problem. I think it's just, so. I think constructing rain lattices with a large gap is a similar problem in the sense that I think you could probably write down an algorithm that does it, but I don't know. I, did, I think it'd be a hard problem to try to actually do. Well, it. I just gave you the algorithm: run your random number generator for which 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 makes a pixel rotation matrix, and that's it. You, you showed us on average, an uh, uh, lattice has a very large gap. So it means that if you pick one at random, you are bound to fall one. Just pick one at random, then the question is for a random lattice, is it hard to compute the spectrum or not? If somebody just hands you some random lattice and asks uh, to compute the spectrum. I think if it's large, I think if it's in a large number of dimensions, that's hard. But I, um, excuse me. I think this is known to be exponentially hard. It's called yeah. it's called the shortest uh, root problem or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That may be that may be the stumbling block. But I agree. If you think like if you think about the duality, then it should may, maybe it's also true that the each individual CFT is has a holographic dual. I don't know what that would be. Maybe it has something to do more to do with the old, with the older story of of say Witten's connection to Chern Simons, or uh, but I don't know how to do that. I'm a, I'm a bit confused about this train of thought because I thought you said the gap is large, sort of in some average sense, right? But yeah. if you just pick a particular one, the, even if the spectrum obeys this nice smooth row, it's a discrete spectrum and uh, there might be a bunch of sparse low lying. Yeah, there, so, so there are certainly CFTs where the gap is arbitrarily small, uh, but most CFTs in moduli space, by the harm, most by the harm measure, um, have, have their first state at C over two pi E. Okay, I thought, Okay, that's not, I, I didn't understand that from your talk, but okay, thanks. I'm going to believe hi. it. Uh, hi, uh, is, is there a way to see why the KL result on the bound was so close in the human case, but not in the Virasoro case? That's a great question. No, we don't know. I mean, the, the, um, the KL bound uses an idea that we don't know how to apply to Vero Soro. It uses the actual geometry of spheres in a sphere packing. Um, and and there's, we, don't, it's, we don't know how to take that logic and carry it over and apply it to Vero Soro. Um, but maybe it can be done. I don't have an explanation for why we haven't gotten closer in the Vero Soro case. Thank you. Sorry, Tom, but the, at the very least, you need the marginal operators in the bulk, right? 
So those would be low lying. Yeah, they're just not primary. They're not yeah. primary. <clears throat> Tom, I want to ask a question about this condition that rho of delta 1 is over the 1. Can I reformulate it differently? That if I take C to infinity uh, for certain values of delta below the threshold, rho will go to 0. And for certain values of delta above the threshold, rho will go to infinity. And delta 1 is that threshold where the transition will occur from 0 to infinity. Well, if you if you take c to infinity at fixed delta, then it will always go to zero. To zero, right. So that's, that's like a moving threshold with, with c. All right, I see. Um, Thanks. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think if you go even a little bit below c over 2 pi e, then you have an extremely small, like it's extremely, sh the turn on is extremely sharp. Um, I, I, I don't think I've quite checked the, the question that you're asking, but I suspect the answer is yes, that anything below that will go to zero. Well, meaning that you can define delta one by equating rho not to one, but to any finite number. Yeah, that's right. So another way of saying it is that this is the value where you suddenly get, where you suddenly go from having zero states to an exponentially large number of states. Thanks, Anatoly. That was kind of my question. Ah, I see. Yeah. Okay. Are there any further questions? If not, we can thank Tom again. And goodbye. <laughs>